Okay, so today I am doing my February 2024 monthly wrap. And you know what? I had a great month this month. <laughs> I mean, not everything was five stars, but predominantly my reads were five stars. There were some DNFs, there were some DNSs. We'll get into that soon enough. But first, as always, let's put the stats up on the screen in three, two, one, go. For the month of February, I read a total of 10 books comprising of five cozy mysteries, one LGBTIQ+, one fantasy paranormal, one horror, one romance contemporary, and one classic. To my age groups, I read two middle grades, two adult, and six adult books. Sorry, two middle grades, two young adult, and six adult books. <laughs> to my lengths, and I read one tome, two three-quarter tomes, four half tomes, and three novellas, totaling 3,191 pages. And to my star ratings, which I'm so happy about, I had six five stars, which for ten books read, six of them being five stars is incredible. Three four stars, and one three star, which we will get to in just a moment. But first, I'm going to discuss my uh, DNF slash DNS. For those of you who don't know, DNF stands for Did Not Finish. You pick up a book, and for whatever reason, you don't want to continue on anymore, so you put it down, and you don't plan on going back to it again. A DNS stands for Did Not Start. So you've decided you're not going to read the book, even though you didn't begin the book. I have a DNF and a DNS, and let's discuss the reasons for both. First off, we're going to discuss my DNF, what I did not finish, by putting up A Brew to Kill by Cleo Coyle up on the screen. This is book 11 in the Coffee House Mystery series by Cleo Coyle. It is an adult cozy mystery, and I DNF'd this book, and with it, I DNF'd the series of uh, the Coffee House Mystery series, which is really going to take a massive chunk out of my plans, my reading plans for this year, because um, I uh, was up to, with this one, I was up to book 11, and I had uh, to finish book 20 to be up to date, so I was just only at the halfway mark, and now... I've DNF'd 10 books in a series, so there you go. But I do have my reasons. So, first of all, for a while now, I have not been liking the mysteries uh, when it comes to this series, and uh, I'm also getting annoyed uh, with my favourite character, who is Madame. Madame is the... Um, so, our protagonist... Uh, married a guy. They are now divorced. <laughs> Madame is our protagonist, Claire Cosi's former mother in mother in law. So if that makes sense. Ex mother in law. There we go. <laughs> um, who? Yeah. I, there's a lot I could say and have said. I actually have done a video mourning the loss of the uh, Coffee House Mystery series. It's currently unlisted. If you want to see this video, let me know in the comments below, and I'll put it up for you. I think for half an hour, I had a nice little funeral saying. <laughs> goodbye to the Coffee House Mystery Series. It's something I need to do for myself, but I'm happy to make it public if you'd like to see it. But yeah, I love Madame. She's my favourite character, and I've noticed there's a pattern. She seems to be in the first half of uh, the, each book in the series, and then she's gone for the second half. It seriously just annoyed me, because I started reading this book thinking, I really need to enjoy Madame now, because if I don't, she's going to be gone soon. And that just started me down this track of, I've got to make sure I do this this and this with this book and this and this and, this and then just eventually I went, no, I'm not enjoying this anymore. So I DNF'd the book knowing it would mean that I DNF'd the series, but that's okay. It is what it is. So I've DNF'd um, A Brew to Kill, book number 11, and therefore DNF'd the remainder of the Coffeehouse Mystery series. The first 10 books that I did read are going to remain on my bookshelves because I did read them, but I will not be reading the next 10. There are other reasons as well. Again, if you want that funeral for the Coffee House Mystery Series video to be made public, let me know. And yeah, I'll put it up there for you. Okay, um, the, the book that I uh, DNS'd, did not start, is this book, Seasick by Ian Rob Wright. This is book number one in the Ravaged World trilogy, and there was a reason behind me not starting this book. Now, I was... 
Okay, so I had to pause there quickly. Um, so I'm just going to pick up from the reason why I DNS uh, seasick. So uh, every time I commit to reading any book, be it a standalone or a series, I always cross check to confirm and ensure that there is going to be an audio version available because I don't know if I'm going to be in the mood to physically read, but I know that I'll always be in the mood to read the listen to the audio version. And so when I decided to add Ravaged World, which Seasick is book one of the Ravaged World trilogy by Ian Rob Wright, to my SAS list, it all three books were available on Audible. Now that I once I got up to uh, Seasick in February, suddenly Seasick book one and as well Ravage book two were no longer available on Audible. And I went into a bit of a mood. Honestly, it's the only horror series I have on my SAS list. It's my only Ian Rob Wright series I have on my SAS list. I wasn't happy. <laughs> um, I uh, So I just went, yeah, look, fine. I'm DNFing another series. I'm, well, DNSing because I didn't even start. Uh, but then I ended up reaching out to Ian Rob Wright, who I've spoken to before. I've communicated with him before. And as always, Ian Rob Wright got back to me, which I really do appreciate. There are a number of authors that I've reached out to who don't communicate with me for whatever reason, but Ian Rob Wright absolutely does. So if you ever have a question for Ian Rob Wright, I highly recommend reaching out to him. He will absolutely get back to you. And he told me the reason the first two books are no longer available is because the audiobooks expired. They are getting redone as we speak, and they're going to be up the redone versions are going to be put up soon. So what I'm going to do is I'm shelving the Ravaged World trilogy uh, for later on when those audiobooks are available. And when they are in that month, I will read all three in the one month. So yeah, just shelving it for now, which is lovely. All right, let's move on to what I did read, however, this month. And we're going to start with the first book that I read in the month of February, which is this massive chunker called The Reckoning by Caroline Peckham and Susan Valenti. This is book number three in the Zodiac Academy series. It is... Well, they market it as new adult, but I refer to it as an adult series, and I gave this particular book in the series five stars. It was a wonderful start to my month. So let's talk about the premise of this book. Um, before I do, just quickly an overview. I love this series as a whole. I have read the original novella 0 0.5 as well as book one and book 1.5 and book two. And this was book three. And I'm reading book four as the first book that I read in March. I love this series. I cannot get enough. And if you have any other recommendations for Caroline Peckham and Susan Valenti series that you've read outside of Zodiac Academy, please let me know because I love this series so much. I'm obsessed with it and would love to read more works from either or both of these authors uh, in another series that's not Zodiac Academy. But the premise for this particular one, again, book number three in the series, is the week of reckoning has begun and senior students have been tasked with making the freshmen's lives pure hell as they prepare to take their fateful assessment. With the lunar eclipse on the horizon, Tori and Darcy are have more to worry about than just passing their exams. A dark plot is unfolding and the shadows are drawing closer. So to my thoughts, and this was a fantastic book as well as the others, as all of the others have been so far, but what made this better was the reckoning itself. I feel like we've been building towards the mo that moment, all series, so I'm intrigued to see where things go from here. I love that Tori and Darcy's forms were revealed as well and really enjoyed the tests. I have loved the airs since as told by the boys and still do. Really love this series and can't wait to keep reading it. An overwhelming five stars from me. The next book that I read helped me to close out the first series on my SAS list. Woo! So, yeah, if we take out the Coffee House Mystery series, I have 20 series to get through in 2024. And I have finished the first one. Woo! <laughs> and that was this book, The King's Men by Nora Sakovich, which is the third and final book 
at least to this stage. I don't think there's going to be a fourth book because it's been way too long since book three came out. But anyway, the third and presumably final book in the All for the Game series. This is a YA LGBTIQ plus book. However, I will say this. I've been uh, saying to you with books one and book two that they are also categorized as YA LGBTIQ plus. I disagree with books one and book two. I would say go into them thinking they are YA sporting contemporaries, but book three is definitely adequately categorized as a YA LGBTIQ+. So I appreciate it. It took three books for us to finally get to the LGBTIQ plus themes, but they finally arrived in book three. So the premise of book three is Neil Jostin is out of time. He knew when he came to PSU he wouldn't survive the year, but with his death right around the corner, he's got more reasons than ever to live. Befriending the foxes was inadvisable. Kissing one is unthinkable. Neil should know better than to get involved with anyone this close to the end, but Andrew's never been the easiest person to walk away from. If they both say it doesn't mean anything, maybe Neil won't regret losing it, but the one person Neil can't lie to is himself. And so to my thoughts, I really enjoyed this one a lot. It's definitely the best book in the entire series and 100% warrants the LGBTIQ plus genre. I loved all moments with Neil and Andrew and enjoyed all the XE matches also. I love this team so much and overall really enjoyed my time with the series. I'm saddened that it's come to an end, but I'm incredibly thankful for it. And once again, I gave this book five stars and I've now wrapped up a series on my sass list. Woo! We celebrate all wins here. No win is too big or too small. <laughs> the next book that I read uh, was the opposite, actually. It helped me to begin a series, and that is this book, Love and Gelato, by Jenna Evans Welch. This is book number one in the Love and Gelato series, or trilogy. It is a YA romance contemporary, and I gave this book also a total of five stars. Now, um, I just want to make a quick note, uh, two quick notes about this, actually. I have been wanting to read the Love and Gelato trilogy for at least three years now. <laughs> it's one of those things. If you've been with me for a while now, you know, when I finally pick up a book that I've been waiting to read for so many years, it's like, oh, I'm so happy I'm finally doing this. And then I get to have my reaction of, was it worth all the anticipation I had over the years or not? In this case, it absolutely was. But then I realised that this seems to be less a Love and Gelato series and more a Love and Gelato universe. The reason I'm saying this is because there are three books in this trilogy and each book follows completely different characters than the characters that we followed in any of the books that preceded them. So it's like three standalones that have been bound together by theme as opposed to bound together by characters, if that makes sense. But the premise for this one... Uh, Love and Gelato is Lena is spending the summer in Tuscany, but she isn't in the mood for Italy's famous sunshine and fairy tale landscape. She's only there because it was her mother's dying wish that she get to know her father. But what kind of father isn't around for 16 years? All Lena wants to do is get back home. But then Lena is given a journal that her mum had kept when she lived in Italy. Suddenly Lena's uncovering a magical world of secret romances, art and hidden bakeries, a world that inspires Lena along with the ever so charming Wren to follow in her mother's footsteps and unearth a secret that has been kept for far too long. It's a secret that will change everything Lena knew about her mother, her father, and even herself. And so to my thoughts, this was a really beautiful story. I loved that it was set in Italy and that we got to experience the Italian culture. I loved Lena as a character and really enjoyed Lena's reading the journal and finding out more about her mother. Ren was a great character too. All in all, a really beautiful contemporary romance that I do highly recommend. And I gave this book five stars. The next book that I read was this book, Death of an Ice Cream Scooper by Lee and Hollis. This is book number 15 out of the currently published 16. <laughs> I'm so close to being caught up, which is good and bad. <laughs> In the Hayley Powell Food and Cocktail Mystery series, this is an adult cozy mystery, and I gave it five stars. Honestly, Death of an Ice Cream Scooper was fantastic as 
pretty much 90% of the books in this series is. I think there's only two books in this entire series that I did not like. The rest I either liked, loved, or I'm completely obsessed with. <laughs> so the premise of this particular one is food and cocktails columnist Hayley Powell is back on the case in Bar Harbor, Maine, when her friend and owner of a gourmet ice cream shop finds that her husband may be a cheater and a killer. So to my thoughts, as always with this series, I love loved this book. I love Hayley as a sleuth and as a person in general. I enjoyed the mystery a lot also. I loved Hayley's, I love Hayley's friends, Mona and Liddy, and I really enjoyed that her son, Dustin, was in this one. Because we don't really see a lot of Dustin, we see a lot of her, of Hayley Powell's daughter, but in this one, her son comes to stay, which was fantastic. And so I need to take that moment to, to pinpoint that and celebrate that. Yay, we got Dustin in this book. <laughs> fantastic book, as every one of the books in the series are, well, bar two, <laughs> but I love the rest. So still, you know, out of 14 or 15, whatever it is, uh, just quickly. Um, yeah, uh, if, if I don't like two out of 15 books, that's still 13 that I love. <laughs> so it's still predominantly love. Um, yeah, but just fantastic. I'm just sad I only have one book left as before I'm completely up to date, but I gave this one five stars. Yeah, so the good comes with the bad. Now that I have read Death of an Ice Cream Scooper, I only have Death of a Clam Digger left, and once I've read that, I am up to date. The good news is there is more coming out. Yay! The bad news is I'll have to wait after Death of a Clam Digger for the rest of the Hayley <laughs> Powell books to come out, rather than reading them whenever the heck I want to. But I love this series, and if you are looking for a cozy mystery series that leans more on the side of the cozy, uh, cozier side of cozy mysteries rather than the grittier side, then I highly recommend the Hayley Powell Food and Cocktail Mystery Series. It has been a fantastic ride for me. Five stars. The next book that I read was this book, Put Out to Pasture, by Amanda Flower. This is book number two in the Farm to Table series. It is an adult cozy mystery series, and I gave this book a total of four stars. Okay, so I love Amanda Flower. I'm, I have this goal at the moment to read all of Amanda Flower's series and create a shelf entirely dedicated to Amanda Flower. So I, I usually categorize my bookshelves um, by genre. So I'll have you know my fantasy shelf, my cozy shelf, my horror shelf, my contemporary shelf, whatever, whatever. Um, but I do have a Brandon Sanderson shelf, and now I'm working on an Amanda Flower shelf. So even though I'm going to have a bookshelf one day entirely filled with Cozy Mysteries, one of those shelves is going to be entirely filled with Amanda Flower books. I am determined that it's going to happen, and this Farm to Table series will certainly help with that. I did not enjoy book one, but I did much prefer book number two. So the premise of book two is Shiloh Bellamy has saved her family's farm from financial ruin, but now what? She's barely scraping by on the farm's new organic business model, and the fall festival she organized to drum up business comes to a screeching halt when the body of a prominent townswoman is discovered underneath a scarecrow in a nearby field. Worst of all, the evidence points to Shiloh's childhood best friend, Christy, as the prime suspect. So to my thoughts, I enjoyed this one so much more than book one. The plot was intriguing, and so was the mystery. The reveal really surprised me too, so it's not common for me to love the plot, the cosy side of a cosy mystery, and the mystery, and the reveal, but I loved all of them in this book, so that was fantastic. It's not my favourite cosy series ever, but I have to give credit to the vast improvement from book one to book two, and I am definitely looking forward to book three. Four stars for Put Out to Pasture. So the next book that I read is a standalone that, like with Love and Gelato, I've been waiting about three years to read, and I finally did, and oh my goodness, was it so fantastic. <laughs> I cannot oversell how much I loved this book. It is called A Monster Calls, and it is by Patrick Ness. And my beautiful hardcover edition has an, the image of the monster on the cover and like a kind of a grey and black background on it with, with golden medals on the cover. It is a gorgeous cover, but the actual book itself, the plot, is fantastic. And I just need to say, I need to read more Patrick Ness, because the guy is incredible. So this is a, um, well... Some say it's YA, some say it's middle grade. It's really tough to say what it is. I'll, I'll say that it's middle grade, personally. Um, a middle grade 
fantasy horror. <laughs> yeah, well, m- middle grade. So yeah, middle grade fantasy horror. And uh, I gave this particular book an overwhelming five stars. Can I just say, wow, w- 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 wow. Thank you, Patrick Ness. The premise of this book is, at seven minutes past midnight, 13-year-old Connor wakes to find a monster outside his bedroom window. But it isn't the monster Connor's been expecting. He's been expecting the one from his nightmare, the nightmare he's had nearly every night since his mother started her treatments. The monster in his backyard is different. It's ancient and wild, and it wants something from Connor, something terrible and dangerous. It wants the truth. So to my thoughts, this book was fantastic. Oh my gosh, it deserves the gold medal of the month. The illustrations, because the book is also illustrated, even though it's a long book, it is still illustrated, which is wonderful. The illustrations are amazing and definitely worthy of the medal it received because the il- the book received um, two medals. One of them was for the illustrations of the book. Uh, so definitely deserved it. The plot is amazing. It's tough to categorize. I'd personally call it a middle grade fantasy horror. But it was just so very well done, and it all came together so well at the end too. An emotional read for me that I highly recommend to all. And if you have any other Patrick Ness books to recommend me, please do, because this was so fantastic. I even watched the movie. I didn't know there was a movie, but there was a movie made, you know, a movie done for this book, and it was great too. Oh my gosh, five stars. I highly, highly, highly recommend A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. And now, my friends, it's time to go to Tonya Kappasville, as the next three books that I read in the month of February were all from the Campers and Criminals series, which is a wonderful adult cozy mystery series that we are buddy reading over on my Discord. If you want to join us, link to Discord is in the description. It has been a really fun buddy read so far. We read three books a month, and so the next three were my Campus and Criminals buddy read books. The first of which was this book, Assailants, Asphalt and Alibis, which is book number eight in the Campus and Criminals series, again by Tonya Kappes. It is an adult cozy mystery, and for this one I gave it four stars. The premise of this book is telling stories around a campfire at Happy Trails Campground is very entertaining to the Laundry Club women until one of the storytellers' tale about murder and alibis comes true, leaving the storyteller murdered. Once again, May and the Laundry Club ladies find themselves doing things they never thought they'd do while trying to get clues to who or why someone murdered the tourist. To my thoughts, I truly enjoyed this book, which I can't honestly say for all of them. I love the idea of going out hunting for the silver. We kind of go on this treasure hunt in this book and love that Agnes was there. Agnes is the love interest mother. She's like a grandmotherly figure who works as the receptionist in the, um, the cop, um, building in the yeah police station. Love her. I uh, love that Agnes was there joining those of the laundry ladies that went on this treasure hunt. The final climax was fantastic. However, the reveal felt quite predictable for me, and I gave this particular one four stars. So therefore, the next book that I read was this book, Valleys, Vehicles, and Victims, which is book number nine in the Campers and Criminals uh, series. And uh, once again, by Tonya Kappas, this is an adult cozy mystery. And... I gave this book a total of four stars as well. So the premise of this one is when a wedding party shows up at Happy Trails Campground, Mae West is thrilled. She's all things girly and excited to assist the bride in all things southern, which is what the bridge is hankering for. The bri- Sorry, not the bridge, the bride. <laughs> I can't read. Which is what the bride is hankering for. Gert Hobson, the owner of Trails Coffee Shop and providing the coffee for the happy couple, has decided there's no way she's going to help out with Tom Moon's daughter's wedding since she claims how years ago Tom Moon stole her coffee blend recipe known today as the Special Moon Bucks Blend. A public fight between Gert and Tom leaves Gert a prime suspect after a member of the wedding party is found dead at the wedding venue. So to my thoughts, I really enjoyed this one. I love that it made revolved around a bridal party. I've truly come to love Mae West and the Laundry Club ladies, as well as Hank, uh, the love interest. We also learn more about Mae's past, which is a nice bonus. 
I didn't like the reveal, but loved everything leading up to it. And I also want to say that at this point, I love Bobby, her adopted brother, and how he calls her Maybelline. <laughs> her name is May, May West. It's Maybelline, but but her nickname is May. But every time her brother talks to her, it's like Maybelline, Maybelline. <laughs> we love Bobby and we love um, her adopted mother. All right, but yeah, four stars for Valley's Vehicles and Victims. And therefore, it stands to reason that the next book that I read was this book, Sunset's Sabbatical and Scandal, which is book number 10. I've now read 10 of these books. Yay! <laughs> Considering that there will be, by the end of this year, 36 books at least, it's a good start. <laughs> We're just under a third of the way there. But anyway, once again, by Tonya Kappas, uh, Adult Cozy Mystery, and I gave this particular one, sadly, my lowest rating of the month, three stars. So, the premise of this one is a beloved resident of normal Kentucky is found dead on the floor of the normal diner, leaving the entire town on high alert. Faster than the short order cook can say order up, the laundry ladies are in the scene. News spreads fast about the murder, and Detective Hank Sharp is hungry for answers. May West, along with the Laundry Club ladies, come up with a list of suspects, and the evidence is piling up faster than a juicy double cheeseburger. To my thoughts, this one just wasn't as good as the other two that I read this month. I appreciated learning more about May's backstory, as she needs to go back to her original home at one point with Hank, so we learn more there. But really, everything else just seemed rather blah. The victim, Trudy, I had no investment in, which in turn made the mystery boring for me. The reveal seemed very out of nowhere also, which didn't work for me. I do love the series and look forward to book 11, but for me, book 10 was a miss, and I gave it a total of three stars. And to the final book that I read in the month of February, book number 10, which was this book, Five Go Adventuring Again by Enid Blyton. This is book number two in the famous five series of 21 books. <laughs> I have read some of those books uh, I had read as a child, not most of them, the, mo the minority of the 21, like probably about four or five. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to read all 21 this year to read them all. This one is the first book that I'm rereading in the series because I have read Five Go Adventuring again before and I loved it last time and by gosh did I enjoy it again this time. I gave th This book is a middle grade classic and I gave this book an overwhelming five stars. So the premise of this one is there's a thief at Kieran Cottage. The famous five think they know who it is but they need to prove it. Where can they find evidence? The discovery of an old map and a very unusual hiding place is all they need to get to the bottom of this mystery and uncover the true culprit. So to my thoughts, I love finding hidden rooms or hidden doorways or whatever, so having this whole secret way to find made this book incredibly entertaining for me. I love George in this one. She proves that going against the grain can very well be for the best. Timmy was the hero once again. Pure entertainment from start to end, and I gave the book five stars. Yeah, so the kids end up finding this um, linen thing at um, Kieran Farmhouse, where they don't live, but it's close by. They know the people who live there. And um, the linen has these words in uh, Latin, via occulta, which they find out means secret way. And so they're trying to find this secret way. It was so much fun trying to find the secret way. Then when we found the secret way, it was even even better than trying to find it. I, I mean, this is upon my first read, but even though this is a reread for me, it was still fun. <laughs> it was so, so, so good. <laughs> I highly recommend this series. I think Ina Blyton did an amazing job with the Famous Five series, and I gave this one, as I said, five stars. And now, for everyone's favourite game that we like to call Up, 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 These are all the books that I read in the month of February 2024. What books did you read in the month of February 2024? Let me know in the comments section below. My standout read for the month of February would have to be A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. Despite the fact that I've read many five-star books, that one stands out to me big time. It was so fantastic. And again, if you have Patrick Ness, recommendations for me outside of A Monster Calls, please let me know because my goodness what a ride that was. Let me know what your favourite book was of February 2024 but in the meantime that is where I am going to leave it. Letting you all go with peace, blessings and so 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 much love. Please do be kind and love one another and spread your sparkling energy all throughout the world and until next time happy reading! Bye everyone! <laughs>